Wonderful. Uh, so thanks again for joining us tonight, part two of our Facebook Activist to Change Maker series. Uh, we're going to do a quick review, uh, kind of I'll do the introduction and then we'll get started with Mary. So uh, tonight's speaker is Mary uh, Noon and I am Jenny Okamoto. I am co-chair of the leadership development team with Building Bridges for America. Uh, some of the friendly norms is please keep yourself muted unless you are speaking and be sure to introduce yourself in the chat, where you're from, campaigns you've worked with, and of course, enter your questions there. We have some hosts with us tonight as you friendly faces. Kaz is here, Terry's here, I'm here, uh, and we will be monitoring the chat for questions, and we can circle back to those at the end of the presentation. And we do try to keep our presentations to an hour, so thank you for joining us. A uh, little more housekeeping. If you'd like to raise your hand, uh, just go to the bottom bar and hit this reaction button. You'll see an option for raise hand. Uh, you can also do this on your cell phone. If you go to the bottom, you'll see the three ellipses, the little dots there. Click on that, and then you can raise your hand. Uh, so a little bit about Building Bridges for America. I know a lot of you, quite a few of you are returning uh, attendees, but our mission really is to train grassroots organizers. We are all kind of from that background of grassroots organizing. Uh, most of us are founded from the, the uh, Pete Buttigieg campaign when he was running in the primary for president and really realized that there was a need for resources for people that wanted to organize that necessarily weren't staff people on campaigns, but were really passionate about issues and candidates and really wanted to affect change. So we provide uh, a lot of information to inform and engage those types of volunteers. Uh, our values are, are that everyone brings value uh, to this organization, that anything you can contribute, that whatever you want to do as an organizer, as a volunteer, or even as someone who just wants to interact and support and lift up what you think is good out there, um, all that brings value. It's, it's all important for what you're doing. Uh, we follow Pete Buttigieg's 2020 campaign rules of the road. So as you can see there, there's the respect, belonging, truth, teamwork. All those things are really what we bring to the table when we're interacting with you. And we hope that you will carry those forward yourself. Uh, and we really believe that with our vision that it's important to engage and inform that we'll have a stronger democracy <laughs> and a better uh, United States. These are our lenses. As you can see, one of the rules of the roads is here. Uh, belonging is very important. We want to make people feel like they are welcome and they have something to contribute. Uh, democratic reform, understanding that you know our democracy needs to evolve and improve. Racial equity and uh, that rural-urban connection. Uh, being in Indiana, we can see that there's a really important connection there. We're not too far from our rural neighbors. Uh, you're welcome to join us. Some of you already have, and please invite friends to join us uh, to our team up with Building Bridges so you can learn more about participating and actually joining a team. Uh, this is where you can learn about volunteer opportunities within the Building Bridges uh, team. Uh, and also our website is fantastic. Thank you, Kaz. Uh, you can access all of our events, our course workbooks, recordings. Uh, we're going to be putting up uh, more information about our book club. Uh, book club is starting the end of this month. Uh, we have recordings from prior book clubs. Uh, so there's, it's just chock-a-block full of great information. Our calendar of events is there so you can find upcoming events to join us with and ways that you can take action. But most importantly, that volunteer toolbox is there. So our manuals, our uh, grab and go guides, our uh, manuals um, and our presentations are all out there. So thanks to Kaz again for that. A few of the things coming up, part of our intent to inform and engage is of course, more in our leadership development series, Real Talk. We've got Unlock uh, Your Political Power, Pop the Disinformation Bubble. Uh, tomorrow is Grassroots Organizing for Change. So that teaches you about starting your grassroots organization from the ground up um, and different tools you can use to enhance that great documentary series uh, that we're running. And uh, Nessa's on the call with us tonight. She hosts a bunch of fun events, uh, Demopalooza. We do fundraising and games. So that sense of community where you can just come back and enjoy spending some time with people and uh, you know while you're affecting some change. So here's some more of our, our discussions coming up, some more of our talks. Uh, Real Talk, the Say This, Not That is about messaging. Uh, Mary will be uh, mentioning that later in her presentation. And then of course, this is kind of how it all flows. If you see our Real Talk series, it's for that entry level person that just wants to learn more to be informed and engaged. Then our red series, you'll see a red tag, our organizing for change series is for kind of the activist minded person, the person that wants to organize people or maybe take another step, uh, another step in engagement there. 
So let's get started. I'm going to pass the mic <laughs> over know, right? to Mary. So <laughs> the Zoom mic, the mic. So. Virtual mic. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me speak to everybody tonight. I cannot say how much I am impressed um, by the work that Building Bridges is doing. Having worked with candidates, it is the cornerstone of, of success for candidates. There's, when you start talking about down ballots, and I even mean the General Assembly, the senators in the House here in Indiana and across other states, there is a huge gap between a congressional race, a senator and a, a gubernatorial race. And, and we get really impacted by all those election results and by those candidates. And this organization is really helping close that gap with organizers because they only have so much bandwidth on a campaign. Candidates should not be training their volunteers and showing them how to use texting and how to do postcards you know, the way that Bill DeVere just comes in here, I cannot sing their praise enough. So um, with that said, a little introduction about myself. Um, I am the chair of Indiana Women's Action Movement. I come here from Massachusetts. And one thing that really struck me that I wanted to really get more and more involved as we all did at the beginning of 2020 was I really noticed really right away the difference of rights and laws and things that were different here from Massachusetts. And I really felt, wow, I'm living in the same United States of America, but I crossed the state border and the healthcare is not the same. People's rights to when they go to a doctor in terms of exposure, women's reproductive rights. And I know we can all go down the list. That really struck me really, really hard. Um, we, our focus is getting women elected to the state house. Um, we do a lot of trainings. Um, if you want to click to the next slide. Sure. We do a lot of trainings. We open them up to male and female because we know it's going to take a village. Um, one of the key pivotal things I cannot stress enough, uh, along with what Building Bridges is doing, is when a candidate decides to launch a campaign, if a precinct chair has not been doing the work, it's a, a, a candidate has to work 10 times harder you know, 50 times harder to start that organization process. That's why building bridges is so important. And we've rolled out some precinct chair trainings. We've done um, one section of three part series already. We're launching another one. We'll have another one in November, October 6th, 13th and 12th. Super successful, e a really great way if you're always thinking, how should I get involved? This is a great, great ground organization, uh, grassroots organizing um, place to get started. Super, super helpful. And we'll go through all the nuts and bolts of that. And then if you're thinking of running for office, we would love to have you on our, our workshop to kind of go over that first framework to kind of help you start thinking about what you should have, your to-do list and things to check off the box as you get ready for that role. Because we're gonna make activists to change makers, to political campaigns, to politicians. That's the goal. So next. Okay, so today what we're gonna talk about um, Jenny and everybody has gone over kind of that part one, kind of the thought process, the think tank before you launch. What I'm going to go over today is the setup and some tactics to make be successful. Because the one thing I want to kind of switch in your brain is just because we post something once on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter does not mean it landed. So we got to figure out if it did and how to keep it going so we can uh, make impact change. Next. Okay, so recap from part one. You've decided on your focus, you know what issues you want to tackle, whether you're supporting a can candidate, um, women's reproductive rights, gun control, um, you've gathered your team, your, um, you know how you're going to operate, somebody might take Wednesday, somebody might take Thursday, you've outlined your pages and, your, and you made an outline, um, you've got your colors, you've got a logo, you've dove into Canva to kind of play around with it, you've done some research, and now you're ready to go. Okay, so what's next? And the, I cannot really stress the other part of setup before you get to that setup part to get yourself a little organized is really helpful. Sorry, Terry. I mean, sorry, Jenny, go ahead next. Um, and I would also really, really stress because when you get onto social media, there's a little like ooh, pull the trigger hesitation sometimes because we've all seen it in what happens in social media. Um, but there's the great series that they've rolled out, Real Talk series, Say This, Not That, helps with messaging helps you give you some framework of how to tackle these tough conversations and how to um, pop the disinformation bubble. The reason that's really helpful too is goes in a little bit more detail than what I'm gonna go over tonight about how the back end the algorithms work. When you know how those things work, you can go five steps ahead of them. So next. Okay, so this is what we're going after. This is very similar to marketers. Think of Facebook, social media as your marketing. And rather you um, rather than 
candidate is the brand. Your issue is is like a brand. Rather than talking to customers, you're talking to voters. Same thing. So you want to make them aware of your issue, aware of your candidate. And how do you do that? You're, You're really looking to engage and to inform. And then you want to persuade them. You want to think, have them think about your issue in a way that you're thinking about it too, because you're sharing the same values persuade to vote for your candidate. And this is the how you convince the undersiders and expand your, your base. This is persuasion is really key and awareness because on a really campaign cycle, this is what we call the capacity building stage, getting more and more people involved. Um, and you wanna grow, grow that base. And then you want people to actually take action, whether it's sign a petition, show up to a rally, um, go time on GOTV. And I, the one thing about the funnel here is we've gotta keep feeding the funnel. We cannot just do it once or twice because, for example, we've all something's broken in our house. You know, you know, um, the dishwasher broke and we think of like, oh, I need a new dishwasher. And then all of a sudden, subconsciously in your head, you've been seeing on Instagram or Facebook new Bosch dishwashers and how wonderful they're eco friendly now. And that was that awareness. And it's the same thing. You got triggered by a need and then all of a sudden you go back and research it. So this is the type of mentality we want to implement into social media is awareness, awareness. And then the trigger, why it might not be buying a product, it might be, wow, I just went to the doctor and look at my bill. I cannot believe how much I'm paying for healthcare. Or my child has 30 kids in the classroom. Who passed the education budget? You know, these things will start triggering, and start to connect the dots for people. So it's not one and done. We got to keep feeding the cycle. Okay, next. Okay, where should I post? That's a big, huge question depending on who your audience is. So for example, two thirds of American adults are on Facebook. That's 70% of them are on daily. Um, And the place for uh, Facebook is conversation. That's where you have more engagement in terms of interaction. And one third of Americans get their news from social media. So if you have not done the disinformation one, I'm gonna say it like loud and glare, please make sure you sign up for Kaz to go see that because it really, really, it's important. Twitter, Twitter is usually 16% is over 50. The rest are all the young bees. I can say that now because I'm 50 and older. Um, Breaking news. Um, rapid response. Um, this is where you're going to see a lot of the journalists. You're going to see a lot of the politicians, a lot of the quick flashy stuff. Does not mean you shouldn't be there, but just know who you're talking to the demographic. Instagram, 50%, 55% of the users are your 18 and 29 year olds. That is the demographic of the young voters. If you know in your area, you really want to go after the young voters, you need to be on Instagram. Um, a smaller percentage are 15 and older. Um, and if the issue that you're really talking about, if it has a impactful story, if you're trying to tell a story, Instagram is really a good place to be. It's the personal, it's the sharing, it's the more emotional, it's more place for video. People really will stop and look in videos because that's what they expect. They've been trained to go there for that. Okay, so that's some things to think about before you get started. Next. Okay, setting up your Facebook page. You need to kind of pause because... How many people, I want to see a show of hands. I want to like slide my thing over. How many people have been on a social media page and all of a sudden they see something fabulous and they're like, wait, and you email the person who's the administrator and you say, I can't share this. Why can't I share this? Like, I want to share this information. You can't share. I'm sure several of you have experienced that. So you're like, why can't I share this? This is great information. So the reason for that is it depends on, oops, can you go back? It really depends on, what the page setup was originally. So we all have our individual personal accounts. The next way you can set up a Facebook page is you can either, you can have a group, okay? Within the group, you can have an open membership, you could have membership upon repro- approval, or you could have membership by invitation. Now, if you have a closed private group, that is why you can't share the information. So your posts will only show up to the people who are in your little ecosystem. Okay, so if you want to have a group, but you can make it public, then you can share. It really depends on how you've officially set up your Facebook page. Now, secondly, if you're moving on into a political space and you want to be a political campaign, you actually can set up a political page. That's the official campaign for a a Facebook page for a campaign person. It's really important for actually um, compliance reasons. If you are running for office, you do have to click political campaign and you should not 
put it on a first personal page. And I will say about setting up a Facebook page for a cause, for, uh, for your um, advocating for an issue. It really is a good idea at this point, the way we are, and I always advocate for this, is to separate from personal. You know, that way, at the end of the day, you're really trying to um, persuade voters, persuade people on your issues and become a hub of resources. It's easier to organize. It's easier to keep things away from the personal um, congratulatory and birthdays and announcements, et cetera. Okay, next. Okay, setting up your Facebook page. It's really, really easy. Um, it's just knowing how to navigate it. So first of all, if you want to set up a group page or a candidate page or something that's just specific for what you're up to is first of all, you need to have your personal account. If you don't have a personal account, you have to go back and set up your personal account. Okay, I've got the personal account. You log into your personal Facebook page and on the toolbar, you can actually create another page. You click on page and it prompts you to select a category I highly recommend you'll probably be selecting advocacy group under community because you're doing some community work. And then you add your name and you listen to all the, you read all the prompts, you add your name. This is why that prep work is really important with knowing your whys, um, adding detailed information, adding your organization's colors, popping in the logo. You might not want to put your personal picture in there. You can put the logo, whatever you guys have decided. The graphics come in handy nice clean banner across the top that really speaks to what you're talking about. If you designed a mission statement, that'd be a really great place to put the, the banner. If you go into Canva, already mapped out and margined out for you, so you have the correct margins, you can create Facebook banners there. So this is where all the prep work, you're like, oh good, check, I've done that. And then the details. It's really important people come to your page, wanna know your why. Uh, you'll hear me say the why a lot when I do conversations is what's your why? What's your organization? Why are you showing up? Why do I want to show up for you and vice versa? So that's really the prompts will be there. That's what you want to do to set up your Facebook page. Okay, easy peasy. You got this. Okay, tips to connect to followers and likes. Okay, so you've got your Facebook page up. It's kind of it's like a, opening the door to a business. You're like, okay, are they going to come and see me? So now you've got to connect with supporters. So connect with existing supporters, other organizations that you've involved in, same values, political figures. Um, you might wanna connect with the state party if you're aligning with them. Key influencers in the community is really important. Um, key influences are really important because they have additional followers. They have followers who are gonna like your stuff. You're gonna break up the algorithms. You're gonna have more enhanced viewers on your page. So it's really important to really look for those other folks in your community that also have a voice. Um, connect with other pages that share the values. Use video. Video enhances your algorithm. Hands down, number one way to do it is to really keep inserting videos in there. Yep. That's a really key. Um, and invite others to like your page. Facebook knows that. They want you in what we call clusters. Um, it's That's where the money is for Facebook. And they want others to like, they want you to be in the same ecosystem. Um, if you know how to work that ecosystem, it actually can be worked to your advantage. Um, and I cannot stress to really reach out to influencers in your community and influencers in the in the marketing world or the you know we're not talking the Kim Kardashians of the world we're talking the local people in your community that really have a voice um, and are, are doing the change work that you're doing so next okay this is key um, somebody might be at a picnic somebody might be at a party and they hear about your work and they couldn't remember the name of your organization or they only remember the name of the organization. They didn't know you were on Facebook. They weren't sure if you had a website. As soon as you get 25 likes, you set up what we call a vanity Facebook URL. What is that? It's so when people can find you just by Googling it, as opposed to having your name of your organization buffered in with all those numbers, hashtags and symbols and signs, et cetera. So it's really helpful so organizations and other people can find you. It increases your visibility. So once you hit 25 likes, you can go in and do this. Under the About tab, you will find a space that says Create Username. And you can do a special name aligned with your organization, your mission, your values, what you're up to. Um, so you click on that and it says At User. There's a link in there for About tab. And you just pick your name. The key thing is, though, you do, it'll prompt you. It will prompt you to check the availability to make sure it's not used already within the Facebook community. 
Um, if it's free, go for it, use it. It's really important to set that up because it, it, it increases your, your visibility and traffic. Next, how am I doing for time? Am I doing good for time? Okay, cool. And the other thing, if you are on Facebook, it is a good idea to also be on Instagram and you're like, oh no, I can't do two things, it's too much work. You can, because if you create your Instagram account, you do the same steps you went through as Facebook, you put your phone number, if you can do that, uh, if you feel free to do that. Um, don't make it public though. Um, you, to put your name, your organization, the same logo, the same colors, everything aligned on Facebook, flip it over to Instagram. Now, the key thing is you can link your Instagram to your Facebook. So you, anything that you post on Instagram can get automatically and very easily shared by pressing a few buttons. So to connect to Instagram for Facebook, you just go on your Facebook account and you go into your Facebook settings and you look for Instagram on the left sidebar and you just follow the instructions according to that. Um, if you get a little lost in some of these things, there's a lot of good tutorials online. What I wanna do here to, tonight is show you all that's possible um, because that stuff is really out there. And again, I cannot stress, if your voters are 30 and younger, especially if you have universities around your area, it's a key voter demographic or audience to influence, you really need to be on Instagram. It's not hard. And if you want, which we're gonna talk about in a little while, we'll talk mostly about Facebook. If you wanna be able to see the analytics, make sure you're converting it to a business page and you can do that. It's really simple. Okay, next. Okay, organizing features on Facebook. So Facebook has come a long way. Um, it's a, For me, I can say this personally, I have a love-hate fit relationship with Facebook um, because of the things that it can do and the things that it, it, it has been doing behind the scenes. Its mission has been um, one to connect community and bring organizations together. And these are some of the features that actually do, does that. So if you have an important announcement, we all know that in the algorithm of Facebook, it used to be something gets seen because it's the top of your feed. Now it's not that. It's an algorithm that determines that. There's no way around it. If you want, you have a meeting coming up or a rally coming up, or you want people to sign a petition so that your announcement and or important information doesn't get lost, you need to pin it up at the top. It's a pinning feature. Um, it usually stays up there for seven days unless you repin it. And the one thing I'll say about announcements, you really need to create graphics. If you don't create graphics, what happens is people don't read things. They really don't. We are visuals. They've done studies. We all know that we see things in a visual way much more quickly and we get more engaged and we get pulled in. Um, we also know that um, color is really important to choose. You know, red means danger, stop, pause, look. Um, yellow means happy. And people are like more intrigued and more apt to stop. So think about how you're posting things up and what you're you using for viewer colors, et cetera. Um, you can create events in Facebook, okay? You can create um, RSVP lists so you know who's coming. Um, it's really good to make that stuff public because I know I've done it. When you see it at a Facebook event, you're like, oh, who else is going? And you're like, oh, that must be good. She know I don't know this person, but she does. So maybe I should go. So we know that happens. So you really want to make sure that you're creating your events and making things public about the uh, people who are attending your event. Live events are great. Why are live events great on Facebook? Because we all know we have busy schedules, but it'll stay up there thereafter. And if someone wasn't able to come to your event, they can go back and watch it. And if you're doing something that's sharing a lot of community information, you want it to stay up there. You want people to pause. Oh, what did she say? When's the next meeting? Who's this person I need to contact? It's a good way for people to go back and see things. And the other thing, um, people get a little overwhelmed. And because have you ever seen in um, Twitter or on Facebook, it happens more on Twitter. And um, Wendy's was notorious for about this for a while, where a lot of social media gets scheduled beforehand. Okay. And a lot of times, if you've seen on Twitter with the big companies, you'll see on their Twitter, like new happy meal coming soon. And it'll say insert photo. Like somebody forgot they scheduled it, but they didn't go back and actually put in the graphic because the graphic team didn't send it to them, but they scheduled it to stay ahead of the game. You can do that too. You can, for example, if you know that a good rhythm, a good rule of thumb is to schedule um, about three, about three things a week. And so people know 
what you're posting. For example, on Mondays, you might post all the community events that are happening in your area. On Wednesdays, you might post all the political education. You might decide, you know, over the weekend, you dove into it and you posted a graph every, every Wednesday. And on Friday, you might post um, a highlighted page on great local activists that are doing the work, your people personal page. And then the in-between is like the things that percolate during the week, that rapid stuff you want to get in there. So you can schedule. Looks like Mary froze a little bit. <laughs> Am I still frozen? Okay, you're good. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so <laughs> the really cool thing about scheduling is it saves you a lot of time. So, and you're also training your viewers to look for, oh, where's that educational hub? That's coming on on Wednesday. I need to know about that because I missed that over the weekend. They're going to go to you. So really use, it's a little clock. If you haven't seen it, it's right there on your, on your posting. You just haven't noticed it. Um, and depending on which kind of social media page, there's a lot more publishing tools that you have options to, and you'll see them right there. Okay. Next one. And I get to take a sip. As I stated earlier, when you had that big funnel page on it, it's not okay just to throw stuff out there and be like, okay, I hope it works. You really have to kind of set some goals for yourself. And there's a way to do that. Amender, we talked about a moment ago, we talked about awareness. And if you're trying to get awareness around the issue, your goal is to look for a lot of volume of likes and what we call reach, people who use reach it and a lot of exposure. And I'll tell you how to measure that later. Engagements. Engagement is like that conversation. Are they sharing it? Are they having comments made in the in the um, conversation underneath? Are they replying? Are other people jumping in? And the key thing about engagement, that means you too, because people might ask questions. So if you know there's a hot issue out there, that's why it's important to get onto the messaging um, tutorials and the trainings, because you're going to have to get in there and having a more comfortable voice with yourself, finding your own voice is really helpful. And new fans, what posts um, inspire people? You want to learn what is actually getting your folks in your community engaged with you and what is making them share that with other people and inviting other people into the community? Because that's your goal is expand your reach. Okay. How do you do that next? Okay. Whew. As we know, does everybody remember during the election that everybody was on, we had what's his face and I say what's his face because we know who that what's his face is that former president of the United States got shut down on Twitter. And we also know that up, coming close to the election, Facebook, Twitter, Google, were all really nervous about what was going on. What they did was they, from November 3rd, 4th, up until December, it was mid-December, there was actually a, a blackout, what we call a blackout period. You couldn't do any political advertising during that, that period. And before that, a week before, they kind of shut down the parameters for political advertising on Facebook. Why is that important? It's important because we also know that organic reach actually gets to voters in a much more rapid way. When you look at the studies afterwards, after they had those two blocks of shutting down Facebook's political ads, pre-election that week before the election when things were getting hot, and then after the election, they shut down political ads, there was no difference in the amount of disinformation circulating the internet. That kind of tells you organic reach has a much more powerful impact on the viewership than some of this paid advertisement. So that's why the role that grassroots organizers play is vital and key. So unpaid content, that's organic reach, is what we're creating and that does get to the users. Pictures, pictures graphic photos get much more higher on the algorithm. Using, as I mentioned before, influencers is really, really key because they have followings too. And then hashtags and comments, I mentioned it before, I'm gonna go into detail a little bit about hashtags. Boosted news, I'm gonna give you an example in a minute. And post frequently four to five times a week. So let's take a deeper dive into hashtags and boosted news. Okay, hashtags. We've used them on Instagram a lot. You can use them on Facebook too. And the reason why is we talked about it before is Facebook and Instagram are linked. So you're increasing your viewership and hashtags are searchable. So the reason why you have a hot issue or something's going on in community, people will search hashtags. Um, millenniums do all the time. 
And when you want to monitor your, your reach, whether what you're doing is actually working, you can actually search your own hashtags and you can kind of see how what kind of impact you're having out there. And the other, we're going to talk about social media listening in a minute, and I'll give you a little tips on that. And the other thing that's really important is if you have an event with somebody, if you're collectively working with the group, you need to add all their names into the post. Because if you don't add all their names, you're not letting the algorithm find their supporters too. So if you just say, hey, come to um, the community center on Saturday for a great speech by um, a new candidate. Well, put the new candidate's name in there and put their official Facebook page and make sure everything in, is connecting so you can allow the algorithms in the back of the house to do the work. Um, it encourages engagement and you want to make sure that you use hashtags that are relevant and frequent. Word to the wise, before you use a hashtag, check out what that hashtag is actually used for right now because you don't want to use a hashtag that might be inappropriate. Um, that does happen sometimes. So just check out your hashtags before you just start using them. Okay, next. Okay, boosted news. Boosted news is a really good technique because you don't have time to, to, to be looking up and doing a lot of research. But what you do know is I'm going to show you a trick to get news to come into your feed really quickly is you can share what we call boosted news and which has a really good impact on organic reach. So say if you have a hot issue in your area, about children in schools. And you just copy and paste the article, and then you quote from the article a really important or impactful statistic or quote that a politician said or somebody mentioned in the news, and then you can post the article, and then that's what we call boosted news because you're sharing relevant content. I will say that it's more impactful. You can see it here that Deb, I kind of picked one that one of my co-partners in crime did. What she said up here in the top, affordable, high quality childcare is the biggest obstacle to women's financial success. While that is true, that's not a quote directly from the article, that's her opinion. What you really should do is kind of take the stated fact, take the quote. So I put here the statistic, the state's overall index score of 60.6, that's the stated fact. And then the cost, which is the cost to our children, which goes back to the opinion piece, and then you offer a solution, electing more women in 2020. But if you just put your opinion constantly out there with an article, it's not as impactful. It's really helpful if you take a really impactful quote from the article, sandwiching it in between the quote is the stated fact, the cost of letting this happen, and the solution that you're going to offer as a community activist, whether it be electing a new person or coming to the rally to get more information or signing the petition. You want to do state the fact, the cost of what's happening and offer the solution, whatever it is out there in your community that people are galvanized around. Any questions on that? I'm going to pause there for a question because boosted news is a really good way to get information out there. And the other key thing, the reason why boosted news is really key is if people are going to start to click your reputable news sources, because we're all going to pick really good news sources, their algorithms are going to get broken up and they're going to start getting fed more news sources like you're getting them to click on as opposed to the crappy Fox News. I mean, that's another mission you're after. Any questions on that? Because I'll take a sip as I. I was looking through the chat here. Um, going back a little bit, um, Nessa was asking about the use of um, hashtags. Should I use popular existing hashtags or make up original ones for bigger impact? A good question. I would check the popular ones first. You don't want to get lost in the mess of hashtags. You want to keep it local and relevant to your community, because if it's kind of like the macro micro influencer, any influencer that has a million followers, that doesn't matter. That, that's just that's gone. That the but the the influence that has a thousand likes is actually more impactful on the local level and the grassroots likes because there's that trust factor. So think of that when you're doing a hashtag, you don't want to really hashtag unless it's a big national issue that we're all talking about right now. So keep it in two buckets. The um, reproductive rights, for example, that's a big national issue, but a, a local issue that may be affecting clean water. If you just say clean water, it's going to cover the whole state. But if you create the hashtag that's relevant to community water because you guys are having lead in the pipes, try to find something that you create that hashtag that has that momentum that's local to you. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. So like you might say hashtag caramel water yes. instead of hashtag 
add water. Yeah. <laughs> so you might get more specific. Mm -hmm. um, Bren had a, a, a question that kind of follows up with another question in the chat, which was about tying your Facebook to Instagram. Can you be selective what is shared on Instagram? Uh, have, not having everything shared that yes. you post on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can. Yes, you okay. can. Yep. And then um, the question here is, is there, is it a one-way street between Facebook and Instagram? Do they go both ways? So can you, if you post on Instagram, does it go to Facebook and vice versa? Back if you post on Facebook, it's easier to go to Instagram. If you're on Facebook, excuse me, if you're on Facebook, it's easier to go to Instagram. If you're on Instagram, you will post to Inst Facebook stories. Mm. So it's a different channel Yep. because okay. Instagram is more of a story as we call it's more video and they're trying to upload more videos into Facebook. So that's where that will land most often. Cool. Okay. Um, and then the last one that we have to kind of catch up to the chat now is should you have both public and a private page for your organization? I think that was one of the questions we stated, take note, maybe you want to have a public page and a private page for your organization. It's totally up to your organization um, and that's a lot to monitor. I think you have to put yourself out there and figure out which is the best channel and best way for you folks to make an impact. Uh, it can get a lot to monitor. So having two pages, I think would be a lot. Yeah, I, I have found with ours, it's uh, moderator, moderators are few and far between. And yeah, so you don't wanna stretch your, your resources too far. Yeah. So, yep. All right, I think I got most of them to catch up here. So nothing cool. uh, about the boosted news yet in the chat. Okay, cool. Maybe at the Q&A, we'll get to something. Cool. Next, okay, insights. Okay, we mentioned before that setup is really important. We ought to know what's working. What can insights tell you? They can tell you the demographics of who like your page. It can tell you the best time to post because if you're talking to a, a community where there's a lot of people sending kids to school and you post at 10 o'clock, well, everybody's doing carpool, they're off to work. It doesn't matter that you post it, nobody will see it because of those algorithms. So you wanna find out what's the best time of day to post and the best time of week to post. Um, it'll vary from community to community. And if you go online and it says, oh, the best time to post is Sunday nights, well, not necessarily, but the one thing that is true about Facebook in any town that you live that's having a snowstorm, that's a great time to be on social media because nobody's going anywhere. So weather induced, that's the only thing that can actually nationally have an impact. Um, number of interactions with the post, how many times a Facebook page is viewed, all those are in the insights. So let's take a little deep dive into some of the metrics you have access to. Okay, so if you set up your page correctly, I like to put this on here, on the right hand, left hand side, the left hand side of your page, you will have this column. I had to cut and paste to make it so you could re uh, read it. You will have your news feed, your inbox, your events. You will have resources and tools, notifications, and that insight. Do you see right there? I should put a little arrow there. The insights, when you click on that, it's gonna give you more information. We'll take you to there in a second. Publishing tools. We are a public page, uh, the way we've set up, I can do ads. I have to go through the process with Facebook, but we can do ads. Um, so this is kind of like, if I set up my page, right, I can see all this. If you want insights and you're like, you go to this left-hand column and it's, you don't have that, then your page is not set up for that. So that's why the setup is really key. So next one. Okay, so if I click onto insights, what does it tell me? tells me a lot. I just cut and pasted a little bit here. I didn't want to go too deep. It's really something you can start diving into. You can see right here at the 10,000 reaches. You can see from September um, 6 to 12, we reached 10,000 people with our posts. Um, if I click on that, it'll give me a deeper dive into that. I just, I didn't click on it for, for various reasons. Um, posts engaged, that means because there's a thing in the social media world we call open rate with a opened it and then there's your click rate and then there's your conversion you kind of want to walk them down that funnel so just reaching is not necessarily oh they reached the 10,000 people that's awesome mm -hmm. that's step one step two is you have to get them to engage with it so that's really a more powerful statistic underneath where you see posts engaged and then if you notice step over here I really wanted to highlight how the videos have a really higher reach and engagement um, you can see that week we post a lot of videos. It was a lot of great content in our video posting. It was up 300%. Next. 
Yeah, three hundred percent. So this is really good information. You'll be clicking on these squares. It'll give dive you deeper into some of the analytics. Any questions there? It's kind of fun to go into this and see. Okay, cool. Let me check the chat out here. Um, do do. Okay. As for boosted news, does the algorithm work the same on Twitter as it does on Facebook? Hmm. Not as readily quickly, but yes, you are breaking up someone's Instagram and uh, excuse me, their feed in Twitter. Okay. Facebook is more locked into clusters. Twitter is a close second. Okay. Karen has a good question. If the Facebook is set up incorrectly and there are no insights, can the set be, can you fix it? So you can get to insights. Yes, you can, but then it has to go back through Facebook and you have to get authorized to change your page. It can take a day, five days, okay. 10 days. It's you can do it. Okay. And then last question for Bren here before we go forward is what's too many posts on a day? In uh, one good day? question. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it really depends on your platform. So Twitter, have at it. Rapid response, you can post on Twitter as many times as you want in a day. Um, in regards to Instagram, you could do twice a day on Instagram and Facebook. It's usually once a day, Facebook, you want to be repetitive and during the week to break up the algorithms. Um, if it's a hot topic, if you, um, it's how you say it too on Facebook, for example, we're in the election cycle coming up. And if you say, Hey folks, I want to make sure our evening viewers get a chance to know that this is happening couch it in that way so your people don't get annoyed that you're constantly posting so you got to be careful okay all right so we can move on um nessa was saying she was glad to hear that about twitter because she didn't want to post too much on twitter nessa's kind of our twitter maven there so yeah keep posting oh, yeah, no, on twitter as much as you it. want yep <laughs> <laughs> have at it yep. you expect it like i have alert set and if i don't see from somebody i'm like oh i haven't seen they're quiet they're on vacation you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> So, okay. Cool. Okay. Well, this is a cool concept. This is really, really, really the nuts and bolts of, as we talked about, the studies came from Duke University after the political ad ban, and we that really didn't have a really big impact because we know organic reach is a more powerful way in social media. So we all get really caught in the marketing world and in the data world and these political campaigns, we all go on digital, is to really look at the numbers, okay? But that only tells you one piece of the story. It is important to know if your reaches and your engagements are happening. But the other thing is how do people feel? We're dealing with voters, okay? I'll tell you a story about why this is so important. What is social media listening? listening? It's listening to the people on your Facebook page, how they feel about something. This is not the numbers, this is the emotions, this is the agreeing to disagree, it's the feeling, it's the attitudes. Um, um, ben and Jerry's gets a lot of their ice cream flavors from listening to the people on social media. Um, uh, Co uh, Coca-Cola owned by Gator, Coca-Cola who owns Gatorade um, had this big, huge roadblock. They were coming up against Power Aid, and they couldn't figure out why their sales were so dropping. They started looking at the feedback in social media listening, and they realized that the consumers wanted a pre-workout drink, a workout drink, and a post-workout drink. Well, they were the first ones that came out of that. That idea didn't come from someone sitting in a behind an office desk saying, hey, let me think about how to recreate Gatorade. It actually came from them listening to the consumers. So we can do the same thing in the political space. So social media listening is measuring the sentiment of the followers. It's their attitudes and feelings rather than the count numbers. Um, read the comments. How many happy faces? How many sad faces? How many angry faces? This is actually really important. And in doing so, by reading the comments and finding out what's going on on those posts, you'll actually find influencers in there too. Um, I know sometimes this is hard because sometimes you kind of have to have a, a, an aid next to you when you do this is you really need to go in the other side of the canon and go read and do social media listening, let's say on Senator Braun's page, on Senator Tog Young page. It's really important to understand what's happening on the other side of the aisle too. Um, so don't just get stuck in your own tunnel because it's really important to know how they're feeling about the issues because what you'll notice is, wow, they're really incorrect. This is an avenue I can go down and really get this out into my community. And hopefully it'll uh, filter on out. So you gotta do both sides of the aisle. Um, 
Next one. How do you do that? So some free tools for social media listening. You can go into Google Analytics and you, there's some free tools right there in Google Analytics for social media listening, socialmediamention.com. And um, there's also these word clouds out there and you can put in some parameters from social media. Um, social mention, that's why you wanna put hashtags and all the different um, people that you, you know, if you're talking about an event and you put the other candidate, all those little um, isms will help pull out the social media listening. Um, Google alerts, we're gonna go over in a second. Those are some other free tools to help you get into the issues for you. And the reason why it's important to do the social media listening, because if you, we circled back, we talked about um, how often a word is, is mentioned. You'll find that in social media listening. We'll tell you the strength. So it'll go back to the passion and the reach. We're really trying to figure out how our community feels about the issue. And if we don't measure some of this, we really will just be throwing things out at, into the dark, into the dark of the web, and we won't have an understanding of what's, of what's going on. So Google Analytics, Social mention, there's, if you really get into it, there are some paid subscription services that you can actually use. If you have an organization that maybe has a little money set up inside and you really wanna get to know your community. Um, additionally, a lot of these services have one month free trials. It's called Sprout Social, Hootsuite are some of them. Um, so there are tools to, for advocates to use with and grassroots organizations to use to really figure out how to best tackle and get a sentiment analysis of what's happening in their community. Um, so next, let's talk about Google Analytics. Google Analytics is like the slice, like really makes your life easier. Um, what is Google Analytics? Those are setting alerts into your inbox so you don't have to go out and find issues, news on the issues. For example, this is just a copy and paste that I did. So you go to Google Alerts, google.com slash tag backslash alerts. What does it do for you? You follow the prompts and I put in redistricting Indiana. So now once I go through the search options and I answer all the questions, it prompts me to answer. I will now every morning, which has been firing off rapidly right now, any article out there on the web, I don't have to search it about redistricting in Indiana comes into my inbox. Whoa! I wake up in the morning like, wow, there's five articles out there. A um, couple of the couple of the newspapers around Indiana are really good about giving details, and you can see some of them just copied and pasted, and they just didn't mu do much. So you will find sources for you. You can have your your Google Alert set to environmental issues, farming issues, whatever it is in your community, so you can be in the know to get back to that boosted news to get people to be in the know about what's happening around your community. Be careful because you can get your inbox flooded. If you Google how to bundle my Google alerts, it will all come in one time of the day so you can kind of see them in a stream so you don't feel like you're getting overloaded and get lost with important stuff that you're also doing that personally or professionally. So um, there's a way to bundle it. A couple extra steps to go through if you choose to, but um, a great way to get the boosted news topics into your inbox without you having to search the web for it. Okay, next. I think that's it. I think that was the last one. Can you believe it? That went by. Such good information. It's like awesome. So Kaz mentioned in the chat that these slides will be posted on that resource page of the building bridges for America.com. So I'd like to tell before so you're not like copiously writing notes, but you will have um, access to these slides at a later date. And of course, tomorrow night, we're going to talk grassroots organizing for change, how to build your grassroots organization. Um, and then uh, later on, we do one that's called events for change. And uh, we focus on tools that you can use for organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, in like managing your events. And uh, well, it looks like all three of these are my presentations, actually. <laughs> uh, we talk about messaging and say this, not that, which is super exciting. It's a super. very interesting why messages are kind of like uh, people absorb them, why they don't, uh, how we can talk to people uh, and structure that a little bit, kind of like what Mary was talking about, providing the solution, the problem, that facts, that kind of thing, uh, and, and how to form that messaging. So let's hop off and go over to the questions. I, I saw that some more being posted. So uh, this is awesome. Thanks for posting those, Kaz. Excellent. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and Nessa's saying, you know, it's excellent training. We don't use Facebook a lot. I use Facebook 
cookbook for organizing. Um, it's not necessarily something that I personally use for like personal information, um, but it is a great tool and there's such an influence because you do have that huge category of people that are affected, tons of disinformation are being uh, loaded there. Yes. So let's go to stop recording uh, so we can uh, finish up and let people kind of 